In this video, I'm going to be walking you through the imaging diagnosis of acute cholecystitis. For more educational resources like our surgery HMP notebook, check out medicalbasics.com. So this video is really going to be catered towards medical students, non-radiology residents, and I'm going to be talking about some of the common clinical signs and symptoms, causes, and some of the imaging findings that we should expect as well as some complications of acute cholecystitis. So the clinical signs and symptoms of acute cholecystitis are going to be something probably most of you are familiar with, but just to review, right upper quadrant pain, nausea, vomiting, and fever, and a Murphy sign. And remember, Murphy sign essentially means you're going to have cessation on inspiration when you're palpating the right upper quadrant. And the sonographic Murphys is similar but slightly different. Essentially, it's you're having maximal pain when you're imaging over the gallbladder and pushing down on it. So it's essentially that you're confirming that it's truly pain secondary to the gallbladder and not somewhere else. Many different causes of acute cholecystitis, gallstones being the number one cause by far. You can also have chemical injury from bile salts or inflammation. You can have high drops, which is essentially distension that leads to diminished blood flow, which eventually leads to ischemia of the gallbladder. It can also be secondary to infection as well. When we think about imaging of acute cholecystitis, ultrasound is going to be the number one method that we're going to be using. Now remember, acute cholecystitis, just like acute pancreatitis, is going to be a clinical diagnosis, but imaging will help to push you in the direction of a, a positive uh, acute cholecystitis or not. So it's now surprised that the most sensitive signs of acute cholecystitis is going to be a sonographic Murphy's, which is essentially a clinical diagnosis, but we're using the ultrasound probe to confirm it, and cholecystitis. So in this example here, what we have is we have the multiple of these gallstones, which are these hyperechoic with po posterior acoustic shadowing foci. This example also shows gallbladder distension and sludge, which I'll talk about in a second. And then here we have another secondary sign, which is our gallbladder wall thickening. So from here to here, there's two layers of our gallbladder wall. Anything over three millimeters is considered thickened. You can also have pericholecystic fluid as our secondary sign, essentially fluid around the gallbladder. That's all that means. So you can have this right here is going to be our pericholecystic fluid. It can be linear. Sometimes we'll find it and it'll be triangular, essentially adjacent to the gallbladder. But fluid is not a typical thing that we're going to see. And this is different from like ascites or perihepatic fluid, which you'll see adjacent to the liver. Next thing that I mentioned before is going to be sludge. And essentially what you're looking for is something layering, some fluid, fluid levels, something that could also potentially be mobile. Although, for example, tumefactive sludge or a more compact sludge is not going to be very mobile, but you can imagine if this patient was turned on their side into their lateral decubitus, it would, the sludge would move and it would layer in a different conformation, kind of confirming that it was sludge. This kind of looks like this homogeneous, non-shadowing debris. The next thing is going to be gallbladder wall hyperemia. Essentially all that means is the wall has more vascularity going to it. Anything that's inflamed is going to be much more vascular. It's going to have much more blood flow going to that. So you're going to have increased color Doppler flow going to that. That's, that's what all these little red and blue foci mean, is just increased vascularity to the, the gallbladder wall. Similarly, you can measure the velocities of, of the various arteries, one being the cystic artery, which is the main artery that supplies the gallbladder. Different literature shows different things, but the numbers that um, I've seen is anything over 40 for the cystic artery velocity is considered abnormal. The next thing is going to be a HIDA, and HIDA is something actually that a lot of people, a lot of clinicians don't know about, but it's something that is very, very important to diagnosing cholecystitis. Oftentimes what we use this for is when ultrasound or CT are equivocal, and we're not entirely sure we want a definitive answer for whether or not the patient has acute cholecystitis, we get a HIDA. The reason why we don't typically do this first is these exams actually take a very long time and take up four hours before we actually have a true diagnosis, and also patients need a lot of coordination in terms of getting these scans both in uh, you know the personnel to do it medications that they can't take like opioids and then also they have to be in a certain stage of their MPO status usually 4 to 24 hours is what we like to have these patients be but essentially this is a normal example I'll show you an abnormal example in a second it's fairly simple you're giving a tracer through the blood these tagged radio tracers go to certain parts of the body that uptake in in this situation for a HIDA it gets taken up in liver gallbladder the biliary system and then also 
small bowel, which we don't really see in this situation, but that's okay. What you're looking for in a normal situation is for the gallbladder to show up, which is this guy right here, right? We see the gallbladder popping up in each of these situations, and that's a normal exam. In an abnormal situation, what we're seeing is that we have the liver being taken up with tracer, we have the common bile duct, the biliary system, and then we eventually have the small bowel, like I was mentioning before. But if you can see, you don't see any uptake within the gallbladder fossa. This is a diagnosis of acute cholecystitis. Essentially, if there's absent filling after four hours, we'll do a variety of different things. For example, we'll give morphine to kind of contract the sphincter and see if we can push tracer into the, the gallbladder. But essentially, the reason why this works is in an inflamed system, an inflamed gallbladder, there's going to be more pressure in the gallbladder than there is in the biliary system. So it's just like anything you've learned in physics. You want to go to the path of least resistance. So from the liver, if there's too much inflammation, too much pressure, within the gallbladder, it's not going to want to go in there. So it's going to go outside into the, into the biliary system, into the small bowel. So that's a, a diagnosis of acute cholecystitis. Chronic cholecystitis is slightly different. Essentially, it's chronic inflammation. You're not being acutely inflamed. There's, you, there's a, just a kind of a baseline level of inflammation within the gallbladder. It's not necessarily something that needs to be immediately treated, but it's something that can be treated, you know, based off the surgeon and the patient. But essentially what you're looking for is both a delay within visualization of the gallbladder plus or minus the ejection fraction of the of the gallbladder. So we give CCK, essentially CCK contracts the gallbladder and releases all of the tracer within the gallbladder. So if you can measure an ejection fraction, which is essentially how quickly things are excreted from the gallbladder after you give CCK. If it's under a certain amount, then that's going to be indicative of chronic cholecystitis. If it's over, then it's normal. Essentially, you, it's just like an acute cholecystitis, chronic cholecystitis, you're not going to be contracting as quickly or as easily, and it's going to be slower than in a normal situation. So now we're going to be talking about some of the complications of cholecystitis. When things go on for too long and they're not treated, they can have a number of different complications, one of them being gangrenous cholecystitis. So gangrenous cholecystitis is essentially you're having slough mucosa of the gallbladder wall. And what we're seeing here is we're seeing multiple membranes. So here's the gallbladder wall and you see this other membrane that kind of was sloughed off of the wall. And, and you can also see some asymmetry in the wall. You can see the same typical signs of acute cholecystitis, but really diagnosing gangrenous cholecystitis, you're going to be wanting to see kind of that two multiple layers that are kind of sloughed or falling off in from the, the, the gallbladder wall. This is due to essentially necrosis, right? So we're having necrosis of the gallbladder wall. So a lot of times what you'll find, and this is kind of variable, but you would think, oh, the patient doesn't have a sonographic Murphy's. So that's a good thing. Well, no, not always. If you have so much ischemia that they can't feel anything anymore, that can also be an indicator for gangrenous cholecystitis. But you kind of have to use it in conjunction with the imaging findings. And typically like a boards types thing, you, you think about these patients when they're old, male and diabetic are kind of the most common common patient population that you'll see it in. The next complication that you can see in acute cholecystitis is emphysematous cholecystitis. Essentially, you have necrosis of the gallbladder wall forming gas in the wall. So CT is going to be much easier than ultrasound or more sensitive than it is than ultrasound. So that's why I'm showing it here. Essentially, all of these foci within the gallbladder wall are gas. And we know this is the same thing because this is all gas outside the patient within the stomach. Th that's gas. So it's gonna, gonna have the same density as that. Um, and we see all of these kind of little foci lining the gallbladder wall. This is a surgical emergency. And so it's something that you want to treat very emergently if you do see it. One thing to note is that if you see pneumoperitoneum, which is essentially gas within the peritoneum, that's gonna be a, an indication of perforation if in the setting of emphysematous cholecystitis. So you kind of have to think about that. If, where is this gas coming from? Because you don't normally have gas within the peritoneum. You have it in the lumen of the stomach, you have it in the lumen of small bowel and so forth, but you should not have it outside in the peritoneum. The final example that I want to give is a perforated cholecystitis. And these kind of are all along a spectrum. So these all can kind of lead to perforated cholecystitis in some form or other. But essentially what you're looking for, and it's a lot easier on these examples than it actually is in practice, but you can see these, there's an actual focal wall defect. There's a discontinuity in the wall of the gallbladder. And now you have all spilling of the biliary contents and you have a, a pericholecystic fluid collection that's forming outside of the gallbladder. This is a very, very obvious example. Typically it's 
not going to be like that. You may also see like a focal discontinuity in the gallbladder wall. So this right here is our gallbladder. And you see this continuity right here. That's essentially a, a focal perforation. And now you have all this pericosis thick free fluid. So this is a more severe versions, but it, it are complications for acute cholecystitis. Be sure to check out our website, medicalbasics.com, for more educational resources like our medical ID cards. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more tips and lessons.